Well, well, my name is Winston Sang um, at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health. Uh, welcome to today's webinar uh, series um, on aging in Asia, ethical and policy issues in healthy aging and end of life across the Asian Pacific region. Um, it is very much my pleasure to uh, open this uh, webinar and um, I really want to uh, thank uh, the organizers of Health Research for Action in the School of Public Health and also Institute for East Asian Studies at UC Berkeley, as well as the Institute of Health Behaviors and Community Sciences in National Taiwan University for organizing this webinar series. And I also wanted to thank the sponsors, um, in addition to the Institute of East Asian Studies and the School of Public Health um, and National Taiwan University. I also wanna thank the UC Berkeley Mongolia Initiative the Center for Chinese Studies, the Center for Japanese Studies, the Center for Korean Studies, and also the Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies Program in the Department of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. And it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Andrew Sherlock uh, in the School of Social Welfare at UC Berkeley to welcome and also to chair this uh, convening today. Andy? Thank you very much, Winston. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be with you. I'll have a, a few more words to say as we, as we go along and tell you a little bit about the, the structure. We have um, three excellent presenters and we'll have time at the end for questions and perhaps time for one or two questions after each presenter. But um, I'm very pleased that uh, we're really privileged to have uh, Professor Eiji uh, Miyoshi uh, from um, Osaka University. He's the Dean of Health Sciences, and we're very, we're very pleased to have him with us to say a few words of welcome. Uh, Dean Miyoshi. Thank you, kind of introduction. First of all, congratulations on this great international symposium, Aging in Asia. It is my great pleasure to give welcome remarks today. Aging in, is one of the most important issues worldwide. Today, I'd like to introduce Japan and Osaka University shortly. I am a physician scientist in liver disease. Patients with liver cancer are being much older in a hospital year after year. As shown in this slide, Japan is a front runner of super aged society. However, Japanese elder people are very fine. It is because Japanese foods are very delicious and healthy. If this conference is held in Japan on site, many participants from foreign countries can enjoy Japanese food, such as sukiyaki, tempura, and sushi. In the case of Osaka, takoyaki is very common food and cheap. Please show the building of our school. It is the uh, uh, most fashionable in Osaka University. I am now here. Finally, I'd like to show new institute of our school. The name is Borders Design Center of Medical Science, referred to BBC. BBC is connected by a company, Osaka University. A mission of BBC is preventing medicine and human friendly medicine for an aging society. Professor Kamide and I are members of BDC. 
we have continued our research for aged people every day. I wish the success of this international conference, Aging in Asia. Thank you for attention. Very good. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jim Miyashi. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to introduce our other speakers and just say a few words. Um, it's interesting that we have speakers uh, speaking from both Japan and Korea. Japan, arguably, um, from a population perspective, the oldest uh, population, the old, a country with the oldest population in, in the world. Korea, uh, by many accounts, the fastest aging population in terms of going from an aging society to an aged society. And in this way, both of the countries serve as models that the rest of the world can observe and learn from. I think that we'll see from our presentations today that when we talk about aging and we talk about um, uh, healthy aging, we're talking not only about physiological aging, but really the social and, um, and, and environmental context within which we age, the, the social values, the cultural values, the things that help to contribute to healthy longevity. And it'll be interesting to listen, to see what's being done and what's being learned, both in Japan and in Korea, as we think about healthy longevity, the factors that contribute to it, and some of the implications, such as the um, increase of very old, of um, people both in their 80s, 90s, and centenarians and super centenarians, and some of the factors that uh, then contribute to that as well as some of the implications for families and for society. So with that as background, allow me to introduce our um, three speakers and then I'll introduce their, their presentations in turn. Um, our first speaker will be Kay Kamide. Um, and uh, Professor Kamide uh, is doing some very interesting work with an epidemiological study, multidisciplinary epidemiological study which is interestingly called the sonic study. Uh, septuagenarians, octogenarians, nonagenarians investigating with centenarians, truly looking at multiple age groups and indeed multiple generations to look at factors associated with healthy longevity. Our second presenter, uh, Mei Kabayama, uh, is an associate professor uh, also at uh, Osaka University uh, Division of Health Sciences in the uh, Graduate School of Medicine. And um, her research looks at community health promotion. What can be done in terms of social capital, in terms of preventive health care for older adults who are frail and developing frailties so that they can maintain health to the extent possible, not only physical health, but social psychological health as well, and it's really based on her many years of experience, both as a public health nurse in, uh, in Osaka, as well as involved with various governmental and, and, uh, and other uh, research projects. And finally, um, Ilhak Lee, uh, associate professor uh, in Korea at, at uh, Yonsei University Medical College in the Department of Medical Humanities. Um, his area of research primarily is end of life decision making and clinical ethics consultation, biomedical ethics, as well as studies of human genomics and neuroscience. And he's looking at the Korean perspective on the relationship between older adults and younger populations and some of the implications for end of life care and end of life decision making. Uh, so we have much to learn from, from all three of our presenters. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we uh, will try and have time for one or two questions at the end of each presentation, and then uh, time for uh, hopefully ample time for questions at the very end. So uh, let me begin by introducing um, Professor Kay Kamide from uh, the Division of Health Sciences, Osaka University Graduate School of Medicine, who will be ta ta talking to us about factors associated with healthy longevity with a focus on medical and physical aspects in community-dwelling populations and uh, particularly regarding his sonic study. So, Russell, committed? 
Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful uh, introduction, uh, Professor Sharok. And thank you very much for giving us the uh, very, very uh, 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 important uh, chance to uh, participate in this uh, wonderful symposium uh, for Professor Winston Sen and uh, the, uh, the colleagues. So I would like to have uh, uh, my presentation uh, uh, like a, about the sonic study. Hey, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to present about factors associated with healthy longevity, focusing on medical physical aspect in community drawing uh, world papers, finding from Sonic study. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Kamide. So I'm working with uh, Professor Miyoshi uh, in Division of Health Science, uh, Health Promotion Sciences, Osaka University Graduate School of Medicine. My background is geriatric medicine doctor. Uh, I'm teaching and doing research for under and postgraduate students of public health, a community and health nurse and home medical care. My research topics are about healthy longevity. Japan is one of uh, countries with the highest life expectancy in the world. In Japan, we have already faced the situation that we concern its super aging society. In 20, uh, 2090, as you see, the mean age of male is 81.4 and female is 87.5 years old. And we expected that our life expectancy in 2060 will be like 84.2 years old of male and 90.9 years old of female in Japan. People age higher 65 years old will be about 40% of total um, population in 2060. So we can say one support one elderly era is coming in the near future. As you know, Japan is front runner of super aged societies. At 2015, Japan is only one country where the population of elderly is over uh, 30%. WHO predicts that about half of Japan, Japanese will be 60 years old or older in 2050. During these 35 years, super-aged countries are increasing in Europe and Asia, such as Korea, China, and Taiwan. In Japan, we are faced with Japan's 2025 battle. The year 2025 is when baby boomer generation becomes over 75 years. Estimated number of very elderly population aged 75 years or older is about 20 million at 2025 and the percentage of very elderly population will increase more and more due to falling birth rate. The percentage of the elderly over 65 years is 28% to, uh, now and will reach more than 30% 2025. Oldest old population is most increasing in Japan as you can see, only 90s and 95 years will be increasing, both in male and female in Japan last 10 years. Pro problem of society aging in Japan and other Asian countries, are the speed of aging is too rapid compared to uh, compared with European countries and United States. Upper panel shows 
period requires the percentage of the population aged 60 years and older to rise from 10% to 20%. It took more than 100 years in European countries for increasing elderly population from 10% to 20%. In contrast, Japan took uh, only 40 years and other Asian country will, uh, will, will take less distance for uh, 40 years. As shown in the lower panel, society aging speed is more rapid in Thailand, one of the aging uh, age, uh, Asia country uh, compared with Japan. Years required from 40% to 20% was 12 years in Japan and will be only 9%, uh, nine years in Thailand. So that uh, uh, same uh, issues uh, uh, in uh, East Asian countries. About, uh, uh, about reason, Japan, Japanese people live longer. Social insurance system in Japan could be contributing on increasing life expectancy. Our medical insurance uh, for all of nation, all of nation uh, for uh, start uh, 1961. Free medical fee for all patient was uh, uh, start, starting at uh, 70, 90, uh, 1973 when rate of elderly was 7.1%. Since number of elderly patients and all people with disabilities are increasing, long-term care insurance system was started from year 2000. This is outline of long-term care insurance in Japan. People ask the application to city office by themselves. City office officers check their status of cognitive and physical status and so on. The Committee for Long-Term Care Insurance assesses and decides the over criteria over or under criteria and give the certification of long-term care with a level of long-term care insurance. There are many services for people uh, with disabilities. People can choose according to their dis disabled status. Their care plan is basically made by care manager. These health insurance systems supposed to be good systems and playing a role to, uh, to be a longevity country in Japan. But cost for medical and long-term care uh, insurance are increasing very much. This will be serious problem in Japan. This figure shows uh, this uh, this figure shows how many persons are supporting elderly health insurance. About 50 years ago, one elderly was supported by nine full age people. Medical fees were free for elderly. But in 2025, two young, uh, two young and middle full age persons will support one elderly. That is called 2025 burden. It seems to be the big problem. Thus, the extension of healthy life expectancy, so-called as healthy longevity, is desired in Japan. There is a gap about 10 years between healthy and average life expectancy. So it, it's supposed to, uh, it's supposed to be very important to clarify the factors contributing to the healthy life expectancy. Upper figures show that rapid increase in old population and co continued robust rate 
cause changes in demographic structure and shrinkage of working population. This way shows the, for example, the Japan case. Dr. John Beard, director of WHO, emphasizes that the life course is continuing and the, the diversity in older age is not random. Only a small, very small portion of old people who actually require, require care and support, not all of uh, er, uh, not, not all of non-elderly uh, people actually in the workforce. He mentioned the line of artificial difference should be removed and understand the future society as a continuum uh, that where there are some people's old age may be very robust and healthy and others who might require some care and support. I completely agree to this uh, idea. The World Report on Aging and Health at 2015 defined healthy aging as the process of developing and maintain, maintaining the functional ability that enable well-being of the people of all the age. So, the World Report on Aging and Health 2015 summarized as shown. In investing in healthy aging means helping to create a future uh, that uh, gives older people the freedom to live lives that previous uh, generations could never have imagined. Concept of healthy aging would be certainly important for the rapid aging society, such as Japan and the future as a East Asian countries. This slide shows show that the elderly health promotion by Japan's Ministry of Health, Labor, Welfare, Kenko Nippon Nijuichi, uh, Kenko Nippon 21, second edition. Uh, which is the uh, main uh, target uh, in our uh, country. Ministry appointed local government to manage uh, preventive care for old, older frail peoples by focusing on improvement of physical uh, function, cognitive function, and malnutrition status. To improve the quality and efficacy of prevention projects, it is critical to clarify the factors associated with frailty and to detect the earlier phases of the dis disablement process, especially paying attention to both individual biological factors and social factors. As mentioned in Elderly Health Promotion by Japan's uh, Japan's uh, Ministry of Health, uh, Labor, Welfare, uh, Kenko Nippon Dijuichi, exercise, nutrition, and social participation are, were important for each individual uh, to be healthy aging and longevity, clarified by our study and some previous studies. Medical care should contribute on the management of life, the life and uh, style related diseases. I will talk about this topic from now. To establish the way of healthy aging and longevity, we are investigating factors influencing on the healthy aging before Kenko Nippon Nijuri second edition in Sonic study. Sonic study, septuagenarian, octogenarian, nonagenarian investigation with centenarian. It started from 2010 by medical, uh, dental, psycho, uh, social researchers in Osaka University, KO University, and Tokyo Metropolitan Institute of Gerontology. Until now, there are over five, uh, 50 original publications from Sonic study which is one of representative 
cohort studies for all the population in Japan. The method of sonic study, we analyze the subject of uh, subject who participated in the survey uh, for both uh, baseline and follow-up study every three years later. Uh, participants are community during uh, older uh, people in age 70 plus minus one years, 80 plus minus one, 90 plus minus one, um, and centenarian were randomly recruited from general population through the local residential re registries from four areas in Japan. So four area, uh, east, and, east and west Japan, and city and rural areas. This is a uh, purpose of a sonic study again. Investigate factors influencing on the healthy aging, and psychological well-being, age difference and similarity. So we are uh, surveying uh, four, uh, four or five dimensions, uh, psychological, social, medical, dental, and nutritional uh, dimension. Uh, I'm, show, I'm, I'm showing the, the region of sonic study. So West Japan, uh, I'm sorry, East Japan in Tokyo, uh, for Tokyo Metropolitan, and West Japan, the Hyogo Prefecture, is next to Osaka Prefecture. And uh, each uh, prefecture, uh, there is uh, rural and uh, city uh, areas, for four areas uh, we are uh, investigating in sonic study. So I, I'm showing that the rate of uh, all the peoples uh, in each area. So these uh, pictures are uh, doing medical investigation by our team. So we are also visiting centenarians person by person. Uh, this uh, researcher is the Professor uh, Gondo, uh, one of our main uh, researchers in sonic study. And this, this is Professor, Professor Ikebe from uh, dentist, dentist, uh, dentist uh, division, uh, uh, dentist department from Osaka University. And, and I am uh, Professor Kawayama. So uh, later uh, she has a presentation. So all of uh, centenarians are very powerful and active. So we have learned uh, very much from uh, these uh, centenarians. So to prolong the healthy, um, healthy and life expectancy, prevention and care, uh, cure uh, for uh, cancer and cardiovascular diseases, and prevention uh, and care for uh, geriatric syndrome are important. So one third of the uh, codes uh, for long-term care insurance is from these uh, diseases. Uh, over 50% uh, over from the digeria, uh, dementia and frailty bone, bone joint diseases like uh, geriatric syndrome. So uh, we think uh, uh, disease prevention and uh, long-term care, uh, uh, preventive care for uh, geriatric syndrome are very important. According to the definition of healthy life expectancy, it depends on the life long-term care insurance certification and subject in, in index, including self-rated health. This is a Japanese uh, definition. As I already mentioned, both disease prevention and preventive care for the geriatric syndrome, such as dementia and physical frailty are very important to prevent long-term care insurance certification. Long-term care insurance certification is a key issue in the definition of healthy life expectancy. Recently, number of people uh, with right certification increasing 
increasing. These uh, people is a frailty status. What is a frailty? Here, I would like to introduce concept of frailty and the reason of focusing on the frailty. Frailty is an in intermediate state between robust and disability on, in older adults. Frail older adults are at, uh, at high risk of adverse clinical uh, uh, clinical outcomes such as falls, fractures, hospitalization, and so on. Therefore, we have to make efforts to prevent frailty, to prevent progression to disability status, and recover frail status to healthy status. What is the most important medical factor uh, contributed to contributing to um, healthy life expectancy. We believe that the appropriate blood pressure management could be the strong candidate. This is from Framingham study indicated that the very important result. There was the five years difference in, uh, in healthy uh, life expectancy and seven years uh, difference in healthy life expectancy between hypertension and normal tension in men. This means that hypertension prevention and appropriate management is very effective for both life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. Hypertension is the most common lifestyle related disease. More than 43 million people are suffering from hypertension in Japan. Until recently, control for hypertension and other lifestyle-related diseases is aiming to prevent atherosclerotic diseases. However, blood pressure status would be contributing on progression of geriatric uh, syndrome, including dementia and diabetes. So, appropriate management for blood pressure uh, it's very important to maintaining the healthy aging. This slide is from Sonic study. Age 70 plus minus one, um, uh, subject number is 1000. AD uh, plus minus one uh, to uh, 973 showed the difference. High systolic blood pressure is resulted low cognitive uh, function at age 70, but not age 80. Diabetes and BMI also showed the same result. In contrast, syrup albumin uh, level is significantly influencing on cognitive function at age uh, 80. Frequency of going, uh, going out is increasing on cognitive function, both 70 and 80. Therefore, control and prevention of hypertension, diabetes, could prevent cognitive decline and future dementia at age uh, 70. At age 80, nutrition is more important than controlling the, uh, than controlling the uh, lifestyle related disease. According to the systolic blood pressure category at the baseline, the MOCA, uh, which is a uh, uh, cognitive uh, test, total score at the follow-up was not significantly different after adjusting for the confounding factor uh, models. So severe hypertension shows low MOCA uh, scores. So hypertension uh, controlling is very important especially in 70 years old. The figure shows the longitudinal result of three years later at age 70. MOCA total score at follow-up was not significantly different from baseline, but the figure shows the people with hypertension, especially combined with diabetes, 
uh, at the baseline, at the significantly lower MOCA total score, at the follow up after adjusting uh, for the sex and dyslipidemia in the model of ANCOVA. This table sh shows the demographic medical data of sonic participants. As you can see, average blood pressure level is decreasing over 80 years old. Blood pressure in some participants, especially in age 90 and centenarian, are low. Lower blood pressure is good for prevention for uh, cardiovascular diseases until young old age, but it's low blood pressure it's good uh, for uh, old, oldest old people. This slide indicated that high level of blood pressure is not good for cognitive function at age 70, but low SB systolic blood pressure is associated with uh, cognitive decline at age 90 in subject with hypertension taking uh, antihypertensive drugs. These results suggest that tight control of blood pressure in young old population is important. And mild control or maintaining appropriate blood pressure level at age 90 to maintain the cognitive function. We should think about these age generation difference of blood pressure management for healthy longevity. I will show, show you other topics about the blood pressure variation at home. Upper panel data show daily home blood pressure level and cognitive function in oldest old participant. It is not significant correlation. However, daily blood, home blood pressure variation and cognitive function in oldest old participants showed significant negative correlation. We should pay attention not only for blood pressure level, but also for blood pressure variation in home blood pressure measuring. About long-term care insurance certification, a stroke, joint pain, osteoporosis, and cancer histories are, are definite as causal diseases at age uh, 80 and 90 of community dwelling population. Stroke is the strongest causal disease for long-term care certification. Partic participants having stroke history in sonic study are not having severe physical dysfunction. However, as shown in this slide, participants with stroke, uh, even without severe physical dysfunction, might be cognitive decline after three years later, especially in oldest old uh, age group. We have to pay attention for cognitive decline in all peoples with stroke history. To avoid long-term care insurance certification, Exercise like walking speed, uh, uh, exercise like walking is supposed to be very effective. We, pro propo, uh, we proved this in Sonic study. As shown in this, this table, slow walking speed, uh, less than one uh, meter per second, is the strongest uh, independent factors associated with future long term care insurance uh, certification in Sonic study. Thus, walking uh, exercise uh, from area age is recommended to get healthy aging. Physical frailty is very common in subject with heart disease. This right, uh, this result is uh, confirmed the sonic study. To prevent physical uh, frailty in subject with heart disease. Improvement of living alone uh, and uh, social network with uh, friends could be effective for the prevention for the old people with heart disease. Keeping good uh, uh, 
instrumental ADL, ID ADL is very important. Depressive symptom, uh, may influence or IADL decline only in age 70. This finding means a survey for depressive status is supposed to be very important, especially in age uh, 70 to uh, maintain a uh, good IADL. So, Finally, so interesting, Professor Kamide. Maybe uh, we have to a couple more minutes. It's so interesting. Okay. 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 So, and I'm uh, closing. Okay. So, finally, self uh, uh, Okay. So, uh, finally, high self rated health is correlated with longevity. Anemia is very common in older people. We investigate the relationship between anemia and self-rated health in all the population. In consequence, anemia associated with low uh, self-rated health. Therefore, we imagine the prevention and improvement of anemia by uh, su sufficient nutrition in all the age uh, people may uh, maintain good uh, self-rated health. So uh, this slide summarizes today's our data. So uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to to prolonging to prolong healthy life expectancy, we keep health, healthy aging and prevent uh, long term care. For that, prevent um, dementia and cognitive decline by appropriate blood pressure management in each age and pre prevention for stroke. To keep good physical function, especially uh, paying attention for walking speed, and to keep uh, to keep high level of IADL, it is important to pay attention for depressive symptoms, especially in young old. To keep high score of celebrated health by taking good uh, nutrition and uh, prevent anemia. So this is again uh, the the, the uh, key slide. Exercise, nutrition, and social participation are important for uh, each individual to be uh, your health longevity, uh, clarified by our sonic data and some previous studies. Medical uh, care should uh, contribute on the management of lifestyle-related diseases. So uh, we uh, think uh, to maintain healthy aging and longevity, both uh, disease prevention and preventive care for physical and cognitive decline. Our showing data from SONIC would be useful to do uh, disease prevention and uh, preventive care. We will continue clarifying factors associated with healthy aging and longevity by multidisciplinary uh, approaches. Uh, thank you very much for all SONIC members and thank you very much for uh, these uh, wonderful opportunities. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank, thank you so much, Professor Kamide. Uh, and uh, we plan to make slides available uh, if, uh, at the, uh, with the approval of our presenters. Uh, and so uh, if there is more information, uh, you'll be able to take a look at a later time. And then we'll we will have time at the end for questions. So thank you so much. Um, very I'm, much. Going to, I'm, I'm going to mute everybody and then introduce our next uh, presenter. Um, so, uh, so our next presenter is uh, Professor Mai Kabayama uh, from the Division of Health Sciences at Osaka University uh, in the Graduate School of Medicine. And uh, she will be presenting um, her work with uh, Professor Kamide uh, on longitudinal study of social factors related to loss of independence among older Japanese. Uh, so, uh, Professor Kabayama, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, and Andrew, and, and thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And uh, I'm very happy to join this wonderful symposium and uh, to have the opportunity to present here. So, um, um, my name is Mai Kawayama, and I'm going to introduce myself now. Uh, so. 
uh, I used to work as a public health nurse in Osaka and now working at the Osaka University as a specially appointed associate professor. My research topics are prevention of loss of independence, healthy aging, lifestyle modification intervention, and health promotion in the community. And you see the character here? I, I'm now, my project is a whole term intervention aims to the healthy life longevity by promoting people to measure the blood pressure every morning at home and record it by themselves for the purpose to prevent stroke and dementia, which is the main reason of the long-term care needs in Japan. And this is uh, uh, this. So this is the official character. You, you can see they are measuring blood pressure. So um, I'm going to introduce briefly about Japanese situation. Uh, especially in Japan, the number of very elderly population aged 75 years or older is increasing. Extended survival in very old people is not always accompanied by good health. It has been inevitably associated with greater numbers of disabled who need additional support in daily life. While the number of persons aged 65 or older has increased by actually approximately 1.5 times over these 15 years since 2000, when the long-term care insurance system was established, the of persons with care needs has increased by approximately three times over the same period. The same period. One reason for this may be due to the increased number of very old and also the socialization of long-term care system. Uh, the main feature of Japanese long-term care insurance is these four points. First, the increasing number of people aged 75 and over and second, increased number of people with dementia. Third, the individual or couple only households with householders over age 65 will increase. Fourth, the number of older people increase rapidly only in urban area, not in the rural area. So based on this background, uh, Japanese Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare started to emphasize on preventive care for the older people at high risk of needing future care or support. Ministry appointed local government to manage preventive care for the older frail people by focusing on the improvement of the physical function, cognitive function and malnutrition status to improve the quality and efficiency of prevention projects, it is critical to clarify the factors associated with frailty and to detect the earlier phases of the disablement process, especially paying attention to not only individuals' biological factors, but also social factors. And as Professor Kamide introduced, a frailty is an intermediate state between robust and disability in older adults. Frail older adults are at high risk of adverse clinical outcomes, such as falls, fractures, as, and hospitalization. Therefore, we have to make effort to prevent frailty, to prevent progression to disablement, disabled status. And frailty is a multidimensional concept consisting of social, physical, and psychological aspect. And this is the internet newspaper introducing the government strategy to prolong the healthy aging in Japan in 2015, so five years before. The strategy number one is the prevention of loss of independence, and number two is the realization of the lifelong active society and so on. And 
And this is a picture of the exercise as I took uh, last month. And public health nurses, one of the community health professionals helped to establish a, a regular gathering in every community in the starting six months, as you can see here. And older people are doing exercise in like in the community hall, watching the video. And this video was uh, local government distributed for every community and they gather with neighbors once a week and they exercise with the weight on their waist and ankle to keep their muscles. Then um, I've introduced one of our research about the social participation and their health among older Japanese. In figure one shows the type of social participation of older Japanese. The hobby related group was the most frequent activity and the community based group was the second. In figure two shows the sex difference. Women, the yellow bird, were more likely to participate in the hobby related group and men were more likely to participate in the alumni association. So they prefer old ties. Uh, in table one, uh, uh, sorry, in figure three, we found that about 73% of older Japanese uh, participate in some social activities. And in table one, people who participate in any social activities were significantly in better physical and mental health compared to uh, none who didn't participate. Also, this is uh, Professor Kamide introduced Sonic study. We interviewed to the centenarians. What did you enjoy when you were 88 years old? And high percentage of the night, so 12, 12 years before of them, and high percentage answers that they enjoy the friend interaction and also the physical activity farm work. And from here, I will introduce the researches investigated the factors associated with loss of independence three years later among community developing older Japanese. Um, we conducted a large scale survey targeting for the entire population of the older people in one urban city to clarify the factors associated with the loss of independence three years later. And we thought that this was a population based ex exclusive survey, male survey, and investigated their long term care status three years later. Participants were people who live in the servicity, non-disabled and non-demented adults, older than 65 years. So we surveyed only people who are independent, not under the uh, long-term care insurance. The survey area was in the Hirakata city in Osaka prefecture, which is a mid-sized urban city in Western Japan with a population of approximately 410,000. This is a sunrise view of Hirakata city and proportion of older people was 23% at the survey year. We sent a self-administered poster questionnaire and these were the content, demographic information, sociodemographic information and basic health checklist. I will introduce in the next slide and the loss of independence status, which was certified by the city committee and registered to the city registration. Uh, so this is a question we used to identify the frailty called the basic health checklist. And this was developed by the Japanese Ministry of Health and Health, Labor and Welfare for screening of community dwelling older people to detect those who are functional, declined, or frail. And these are the content. For example, a question 6 to 10 is a category for asking physical strength. 
and this is uh, another category of nutrition status, oral function, house boundaries, and cognitive function. Then go to the result. Uh, 5,608 questionnaires were sent, and the overall response rate to the mailing was 73.8%. So table shows that baseline characteristics of the study particip participants. And the proportion of participants with frailty were 25%. The average age of all participants was 72 years old. In all, 68% participants had some illness and 14 were living alone. 13 had been living in the Hirakata city less than 20 years. So most of them lived in the same city. And 57 participated in some community social activities. And 22% were doing some job. They were employed. And we find there was a significant sex differences. This is showing the result of the proportion and number of the people with frailty. The blue bar shows the number and the yellow line shows the percentage of frail. We can see the very strong influence of age and more than half of the people aged 85 or over are frail, even if they are not certified for the long-term care need. And this graph shows the result of proportion of people with frailty based on age and sex. The proportion of frail women was higher than men in every age stage. And this is a result about the present illness. Uh, participants with present illness were 68%. And the figure one shows the uh, men and women difference the proportion of having present to illness, men were more likely to have uh, the blue one strokes and uh, uh, diabetes, hypertension, and cancers, like the life, re lifestyle related diseases. And the contrary, women were more likely to have uh, uh, falls or joint diseases and uh, osteoporosis, like this uh, muscle sclerosis diseases. And in the in figure three, we can see people who are frail were uh, the yellow were more likely to have some illness regardless of the illness type. From here, the results of the three year follow up. We used the data of 2012. And three years later, uh, we excluded the people who deceased or moved out and analyzed uh, 22,328 people. As shown here, as, um, three years later, uh, most of them were still independent and 6.6 six hundred and six people requiring any partial support who were, uh, we defined my loss of independence status and 392 requiring complete support, very severe loss of independence um, based on the long-term care insurance systems certification criteria. And this is the definition of Japanese long-term care insurance system and we categorized long-term care one and two require only partial help as my loss of independence and three to five completely dependent as severe loss. And the, result, the average age was the participants at the age, uh, at participants at the baseline age was 71. And the figure shows the proportion of people certified for the long-term care need three years later. 
and it was higher for advanced age. The table shows the participants' demographic and social characteristics at baseline, and we find the higher percentage of women lived living alone and no employment and no, so, no social participation was higher for men. Next the table next table shows the participants' characteristics based on the loss of independence level three years later. Social factors among the independent, this green, were uh, no living alone, unemployment, not, not, not employed or social, no social participation were uh, lower compared to the people who were in the loss of independence. And, and the logistic regulation analysis stratified for sex and for sex reveals the following to be independent social factors associated with loss of independence three years later. First, the no employment, no social participation for men and women predicted the loss of independence three years later. And living alone was significant only among women. And regarding the baseline illness, and the association with mild loss of independence was only observed among men, which might be due to sex differences of illness characteristics. People with muscle sclerosis diseases, which were more prevalent in women, as reported in our previous study, might be able to linger longer at the stage of independent living because of the slow change in health. In contrast, persons with lively illness, which were more higher among men, are more likely to experience loss of independence due to the nature of the diseases. So lastly, we did some multinominal resistive regression and we found all social factors were associated with a mild loss of independence. And especially among women, the present illness was not associated. And regarding the severe loss of independence, no employment and no, no employment and no social participation was related. Oh, sorry. And uh, no, so, no, no employment and no social participation was significantly related among men, and only uh, no social participation was related among women. So this is a summary, and we clarify the presenting factors for loss of in independence three years later by the large scale uh, survey with high response rate in one entire city. The social factors were significantly related to the loss of independence three years later, both for men and women. And there was a sex difference in the association of social, and the relation was also different depending on the long-term uh, care level. So the conclusion, the comprehensive approach from not only physical aspect, but also the social aspect is important, linked to maintain the physical, mental, and cognitive function, and prevent the loss of independence in older people in the community. And so as the conclusion suggests that the social factors such as social participation is an important determinant of individual health, the success of a sustainable society might depend on the development of social ties in the community, as well as keeping physical function and mental status. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Kabayama, and uh, appreciate how your presentation builds upon the uh, previous presentation by Professor uh, Kamide. Uh, so uh, we have time perhaps for one, one question, and uh, uh, the question uh, has to do with uh, who, takes care, who takes responsibility for the care of the frail elderly, for their uh, 
daily care, for their financial care? Is it primarily uh, children or social institutions or uh, other, uh, other forms of uh, care or self-care? So obviously a, a big question. Uh, maybe you could answer it briefly now and then we can come back to it at the end. Thank you. Professor Kameyama? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, now it's uh, uh, so for the frailty um, uh, to, to prevent them to get more disability. Uh, the responsibility is uh, mainly for the community health, uh, public health nurses working to the local government, and they have to inter. Uh, do that sense. any intervention and doing work but the care for them is uh, response uh, responsible for the frailty status it's by themselves or for the family not not the public but the prevention program is under the long-term care insurance system so they can have the um, uh, social su support uh, from the insurance to to do the preventive exercise very good thank you very much and uh, i'm sure that there'll be more to be said about that it is uh, interesting to think about how the aging of the population has an impact on our social institutions, on our families, uh, and uh, especially in the context of societies that have long-standing traditions of care uh, that may not be uh, uh, designed for the current situation or the situation by the middle of this century um, and with the uh, increasing number of older adults and decreasing number of, of younger people. Um, so thank you, and then for our Third, our, our final presentation today, uh, it builds upon this theme in terms of thinking about what some of the implications are of a uh, very uh, uh, aging and aged population. Um, and uh, Professor Lee, Associate Professor at the Department of Medical Humanities and Social Sciences Director in the Division of Medical Law and Ethics, also Assistant Vice Dean Education Affairs at Yonsei University College of Medicine in Korea. And uh, he will be addressing us regarding advanced planning for life-sustaining treatment and medical treatment among the elderly population in South Korea. Uh, so uh, thank you all very much. And uh, Professor Lee will ask you to uh, uh, unmute yourself or, and uh, we'll hear from you. Thank you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> thank you for uh, thank you, Professor Slack, for the kind introduction. And today I prepared uh, some current status about the life-sustaining treatment decisions, how it is planned or implemented. And I think I can, it become, it'll become very uh, very important and huge issues among the Koreans uh, already, and it will be more, much more in the near future. And there is, um, I prepared my presentation in the video clips, so you can, I, I think you can share. Uh, I will start it now, please. Let me know if there is any problem for it. Hello everyone, my name is Il Hak Lee from Yonsei University. Uh, it's wonderful to have a chance to share the Korean experience of advanced directive for the elderly people who needs respect and also need the support from the support society to exercise their right to self-determination. And also they need respect and care from the children and also from the society. Oh, it is always a problem for Korean society to balance uh, the care of the elderly and 
also to promote the independence of those people. And in this context, the problem of end of life care decisions uh, emerged. Uh, traditionally, the Korean people think that there is a duty, even some, we call it a stupid or even foolish duty, responsibility uh, to do everything that is possible for the benefit of their elderly parents. But meanwhile, it means such a huge sacrifice. So there is some uh, unsatisfaction, dissatisfaction from the younger generation. And also as the society becomes individualized and social structure is changed, there is some challenge and also changes uh, in the family dynamics. So this is the how the current Korean end-of-life care decisions and also especially the legislation about end-of-life uh, decisions is today my presentation is composed of four parts one is background of Korean society and the current legal structure so-called the life sustained treatment decisions act which regulate advanced directive and surrogate decision makings and also uh, have some mentions about hospice and palliative care and I will talk about some the utilization of the advanced directive and life sustained treatment planning uh, in the healthcare facilities and by uh, this looking back uh, there's some kind of improvement point will uh, emerge. Uh, let's move to the first slide. Uh, as in the many countries, the current Korean legal system is a kind of result of some tragic stories. In Korea, the case was so-called Grand Markham's case in, happened in 2008. The patient was near the vegetative state and uh, there was some legal conflict between family members and healthcare teams. The healthcare teams thought that the patient had a chance to recover from a vegetative state, near vegetative state, but the family members thought she has little chance and also the life that she was uh, living in the, in the ICU was not according to her way of life. So they moved to the court and then the Supreme Court decided that the patient has very little chance to survive. And also the court recognized the patient has a right to refuse treatment, especially there is very little chance of survival. And also it is a human rights, a basic human rights to decide what is good or bad for her. In this grand schemes case, uh, there were no written document uh, evidence proving that she was not prepared to stay. So the family witness was the only uh, evidence for deciding. Uh, and also the Supreme Court recognized the family witness is valid for the decisions. So the legislation began, but there was some backgrounds of this development. As in many Asian countries, the social society is changing rapidly, uh, especially the role of family and the children's responsibility toward the parents is changing rapidly. Like social concerns for aging become financial support and many elderly people become independent of their children about their way of life. And also people began to think that it's 
the society's responsibility or the elder people themselves uh, to support the elder people. And, but meanwhile, and also as for health care, the majority of the expenditure is, comes from the elder people themselves. So the situation becomes uh, like the elder people is supporting themselves. So the old morals that the younger generation should take care of the olders became, uh, began to lose their power in Korean society. And also the place of death and there were some concerns about the too much medicalization of life and death. Uh, this is a graph that shows the expenditure, uh, healthcare expenditure of one person. Especially almost 90% of expenses are spent during the last three months before death. So there were concerns that too much medicalization is like uh, unwise spending of the money. So we could rearrange the budget wisely so the, the life environment could be changed. And also there was some criticism high-tech dependent medicine among the critics and sociologists and also among the healthcare specialists, healthcare providers, there was growing interest in hospice palliative care and also for comfort care and also for patient-centered care. So the legislation had some impact to go forward. But legislation took very long time. It was took seven years of legislation after the Supreme Court decided recommended to legislate a law regarding to end of life care, but there, we had to go through the consensus building process. There were serious debates uh, in the society that uh, it could lead to uh, euthanasia society or neglect for the weak and poor. So it was very difficult to reach a consensus in Korean society. There was debate about also during the legislation, there were debates about the scope of the law should be disease-based or condition-based. In the end, the, the law was specified about the, some poor diseases uh, that this law is regarded uh, but now it is revised to conditions in general. And also there was, the law is limited to putal treatment. So it is the physician who decided uh, the life-sustaining treatments could go on or not. And also this law, the current law does not recognize the surrogate decision maker. So all the family members should gather together to reach an agreement to withhold or withdraw the treatment. But, but meanwhile, there was so heavy safeguard, like predefined comfort care. So nutrition could not be stopped uh, how much the situation is bad and also uh, nutrition, transfusion, antibiotics, or even the anti-cancer drugs is uh, mentioned to be provided or not to. Uh, these too much safeguard seems fine in the legislation period, but when it was implemented, there was very much difficulties. So in the year 2016, uh, we came to a um, legislation of Life Sustaining Treatment Decision Act. Actually, the law has this long name. I will not read this, but usually we shorten this law into like this, and I will 
Act, Highway Life Sustaining Treatment Decisions Act. The purpose of this law is to respect the patient's self-determination and also provide some safeguard against the uh, misuse or abuse. And also it is to uh, regulate or some recognize some uh, patient expression about life sustaining treatments. Uh, the document mentioned in the law is advanced directive. In Korean law, it is translated into advanced statement on life sustaining treatments. And also it's about uh, the second document is advanced care planning documents. The safeguard is institutional ethics committee, which can be translated to hospital ethics committee or clinical ethics committee in other countries. And also this law tells about some national agencies about to oversee general life sustaining treatment decisions nationwide. The characteristic of the current law is very, it has very different definitions from other country. The current law uh, differentiates terminal illness or terminal care from end of life process and end of life care. It's something similar uh, in United Kingdom's uh, approach to end of life care and terminal care. But the current Korea law is very strict uh, in these distinctions. And also life sustaining treatment is defined as putary treatment. So the uh, so we can decide to stop treatment when the treatment is futile or, or it's uh, regarded as futile, mm, and also we have very strict regulations regarding to advanced statement or life sustaining or advanced care planning uh, documents. The law. Uh, recognize these ways of decisions of a life sustaining treatment, patient expression, or life sustaining treatment plan document written by physician. And when the patient has left advanced statement and also which is registered to national agency, the doctor should verify it's, is it valid still now. So the doctor has a duty and the authority to verify the advanced statement. When there is no uh, documents or the patient did not say anything about relaxation treatment, then the family uh, has an authority uh, as in the presumed will testimony or they could act as a surrogate decision makers, in which case the unanimous agreement is required. And the current law requires national agencies and national registry, and also the every healthcare institute has to establish the institution of this committee if they were to provide life sustaining treatment decision services, something like that. And also if the patient or the people uh, has a will to intend to leave advanced statements about life sustaining treatments, they have to go to designated the agencies and have full course of counseling and their paper, their statements should be registered to national agency. And every hospital has to report to national agency after uh, implement the patient's preferences about end of life care. So this is very complicated and also very, uh, very uh, strict regulation is on the current end of life care decisions. So after two years, uh, uh, the Korean agency, national agency made some statistics about current situation. And 
there is some disappointment uh, in the situation. There are only a few hospitals uh, that support or that provides uh, like so saying, treatment, discussion, or decision services. But among the general population, uh, advanced directive or advanced statements gather some popularity. So for, until now, we have 700,000 uh, copies of uh, registered uh, advanced directives. Interestingly, one third, uh, one of three quarter of the advanced directives is written by women. Uh, when the patient is treated at the hospital and she became very ill, the doctors uh, consulted the patient and make some life sustaining treatment plan, advanced care planning. Then they make some document. Uh, the reported document is about uh, 50,000. And interestingly, in this case, 60% uh, of the uh, RST plans is made about um, men's treatment. Uh, we don't know the reason between the differences between advanced treatment and life sustaining treatment plans. It is a topic of the future research. And one two thirds of the patient is a terminal patient, not end of life care, end of life process patient. So we can assume that when available, people want to make life sustaining treatment decisions before too late. But who made the decision? When it comes to the question of who made, makes the decision, we have very some un, uncomfortable uh, uh, conclusion that the green box is a case where the patient himself or herself makes a decision the red one is a family member uh, works as a proxy. Uh, that about 70% of cases, family, not the patient herself, takes the role of decision make, maker. So still, patient has a little chance to know what's going on or take a role to decide for their, about their cares. And also still disappointing is that there were 300,000 deaths happens in Korea every year, but less than 20% of people are benefited by these services. And also there is some misunderstanding like this Life Sustaining Treatment Decision Act is a euthanasia act and also from the healthcare provider's side, they expect that this law uh, provides some exemption to the healthcare providers about their decisions about end of life care. care. So we need uh, some areas of improvement. Uh, these are my hypothetical explanation there is some cultural limitations, and also we can say about the unpreparedness from the provider side and also for the system. Uh, I, I mentioned that only fractions of the hospi hospitals provide uh, clinical practice services. And also what is interesting is those people who left uh, advanced statement is late 60s or 70s, and they are very young to think about end of life care. Yes, they are too young to die. So uh, this is the situation now. So we can have found some areas of improvement uh, like we have to, the law have to revise to recognize the Soviet decision makers as the family structure is changing in Korea, like other countries. 
the partners is now changing. Uh, there are some same-sex marriage still is not legalized in Korea. And there are still many cases the partners who have not registered as a husband and wife. So, but they have no authority uh, to uh, take a role as a proxy. So there is some areas of the revision of the current law. And also we need to discuss about life sustaining treatment, especially about nutrition and uh, hydration, antibiotics, and also we have to broaden the scope of the disease or the condition. Uh, the Korean current law is too, too narrow in the end of life care. Uh, the patient should be uh, literally dying uh, if they can benefit from this law. And also we have to prepare the care providers uh, the society in general, and also hospitals. Uh, and also the hospital ethics committee needs quality assessment and quality improvement activities. So this is the current situation in Korea. I think more will be discussed in the future uh, today's webinar. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Lee. Uh, very interesting as we look at some of the implications of a uh, aging and uh, becoming a very aged uh, population. So we do have questions now, and, and uh, just a reminder that you can uh, put your questions in the in the chat box, um, and uh, please. Uh, address them not only to me but to uh, the other uh, uh, the other folks in the chat box as well. And then I'll be happy to repeat them for our various presenters. And uh, if you'll, uh, we have a number of questions so far, and uh, any additional ones, for Professor Lee. Um, so uh, I'll begin by uh, uh, some questions for uh, our first presenter, uh, Professor Kamide. Uh, the first is just a a, a methodological question. Um, you talked about um, uh, links, associations, uh, um, statistical associations, for example, between hypertension and, and outcomes or anemia and outcomes. And uh, it, it wasn't uh, clear uh, entirely whether uh, these were correlations or whether these were uh, predictive. Uh, I don't know whether you uh, would be able to, uh, to speak to that. So uh, the, your question is uh, other di other diseases uh, will prevent uh, uh, the, the quality status or cognitive uh, decline. And and did you look at uh, was it a predictive model where you uh, mm -hmm. where you 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 had a causal analysis or was it association oh, okay. was it a correlation? Okay, so uh, about the hypertension. So I think uh, mm, in young old age, for young old age, so uh, we have to uh, strict blood pressure management will be uh, effective for uh, effective for prevention of uh, dementia, or of course, uh, cardiovascular diseases and frailty. So and but uh, over uh 85 or 90 years old very old for all very old peoples so we have to uh very cautious uh, we have to be cautious about uh, strict but pressure control so i think uh, my control will be better for uh strict control for uh all this all this old age uh, population but some uh Population, uh, some patients with uh, severe uh, cardiovascular diseases, uh, they need strict blood pressure control. But uh, most uh, general uh, old, uh, oldest old population, I think uh, we need a mild uh, control for the blood pressure. 
and also diabetes and hyperlipidemia. So those kind of uh, lifestyle related diseases. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, so we need the, the, the more uh, definite uh, criteria uh, of uh, management uh, strategy. So for all uh, lifestyle related diseases for uh, very old uh, populations. In Japan, right now, so the guidelines, uh, some these guidelines say uh, for very old people, it, it, the doctors should be careful. <laughs> but we have no, no, uh, the, 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 no, the, the, the data or no uh, 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 definite uh, criteria for the for the management of uh, for uh, oldest old peoples. So we would like to make uh, evidence for uh, making a definite criteria for uh, oldest old, uh, the very old peoples, especially in Japan. So those uh, populations are very increasing. So maybe that's uh, our mission. <laughs> uh, <laughs> very good. Countries. Yes. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. There, there, there's a, a question that really has been asked uh, uh, for, for everybody to think about, and, and that is with a, um, with a society that is aging so much, and uh, a number of speakers uh, uh, mentioned this, um, the question is, is uh, even when you have an excellent long-term care insurance, program that was established uh, you know, quite a while ago now in Japan, um, and other countries are trying to emulate that. Uh, how are we going to be able to afford this? What, what is the impact on, on government? What can we do to, to uh, sustain uh, these kinds of supports, um, especially with such a growing number of uh, older and old old and uh, even super centenarians. Um, and uh, an additional part of that question or, uh, was, uh, and what might be the implications or the effect on younger people? Will they have to uh, receive fewer benefits uh, in order to pay for the added benefits of an older population? So it's a, it's a complicated question, but that general question of so how how are we how are we as a society going to provide the care that's needed and do it in a way that is sustainable? And I would invite um, uh, really any of our presenters uh, to uh, to to speak to that. Uh, uh, so uh, I'll let you take turns. Uh, I don't know, Professor Kaviyama, do you want to do you want to start? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah. Um, that is the main uh, very big issue and uh, uh, the government is now trying to not only individual approach but doing the uh, community approach to promote the health status uh, mm -hmm. to prevent it not only from the old generation but for the younger generation because people who like uh, the professor Kamil says younger generation if they have some hypertension or something like that they may have the dementia in the old age so uh, to invest them to to raise uh, to, to to do much more uh, health check or system or establish uh, to keep their prevention early stage is very important now. Yes. Thank, thank you. And uh, I don't know, Professor Kamita, did you did you have anything you wanted to uh, to add? And then I'll ask Professor Lee as well. Okay. So uh, that's a big issue. <laughs> so so I always think about that, the issues. So um, to maintain a uh, social uh, insurance system in Japan. So right now, the government now thinking about uh, uh, the 
the higher uh, age setting <laughs> of uh, retirement age. So now it's uh, 65 years, 60 or 65 years old is the retirement age, but uh, maybe near future, so government will define the retirement age is 70 or 75. So that retirement, from that retirement age, uh, the government pension paying will start. So, uh, so uh, to keep a social sub, uh, in social sub, uh, social insurance uh, system. So, I think uh, pension uh, paying is, uh, I think, about half of the the money. So, it's, uh, it's very increasing right now. So. That's, uh, yeah, retirement age is maybe uh, near future, so it's high, higher setting. And also we have to do the keep, maintain the uh, physical and mental status, uh, even in an old age. So by uh, preventive care or disease uh, prevention, so which I talked about. Uh, the detail is. So, and also maybe in Japan, so uh, they are thinking about a robot <laughs> or aut automate, aut a drive car. <laughs> so the high technology will help uh, us, you know, the, the, the shortage of the, in the peoples. <laughs> And also the foreign uh, peoples, uh, many foreign peoples are uh, coming to Japan, so they will help us to shrinking uh, uh, society in Japan. So <laughs> that's uh, my mm, ideas and uh, the, the, the real, uh, okay, okay. Thank, thank you very much. And Professor Lee, I don't know if you have any thoughts from a South Korean perspective. I have, in the beginning, I have to admit that the Korea is following Japanese track. Like we have long-term care insurance, just something similar to Japanese one. About 2% of the budget is coming from the national health insurance. So we are thinking uh, current, currently we can say the Koreans are thinking about long-term care for the elderly, especially the long-term care, is about 2% of the budget is enough. But uh, at the same time, there is some out-of-pocket expenditures from the children or the, from the, uh, the elder people themselves. And, but with about the healthcare, it's okay for now. But what is problematic is their living, about their living in Korea. The national pension services still very, have a very low profile. So there is no, not enough is provided for the elder people. So they have some very huge issue of elderly poverty. They are poor and they are sick and they are very alone. So the highest suicide rate is among the 60s, not 20s or 30s. So it is a national problem. How these ignored uh, or neglected people group is to be a focus of a policy. But meanwhile, they are still young, as I have mentioned in my presentation. So they have a voting power, a political power. So you have seen some very huge demonstration amid this COVID-19 situation in the center of Seoul. It shows that their anxiety, also their concerns of these elder people. So, but in the politician side, this is, this, this is a political issue, but I'm afraid, I'm afraid they are ignoring intentionally it, it, it is very unpopular issue to talk about the money or the income or tax. And as a technology issue that uh, we think that the, so aged friendly technology can solve 
or the aged people need some technology or product uh, uh, fitting their needs. So called the general technology issue or that kind of approach uh, gathers some, uh, uh, some notification or you get some notice from the uh, uh, statement of government. So there's some research movement um, uh, in the field is going on now. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, a question for uh, Professor Lee um, had to do with this um, increased recognition of the um, need for attention to end of life uh, care and end of life decision making. Uh, and the question about uh, is there public education or, or is there some uh, government effort to uh, educate people or to, to get people to think about these, these issues. Um, so, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a chance to visit the California Policy, the Compassionate Care. So it, it gave us some inspiration about Korean policy. So the national agency have an agenda or activity uh, like that path, but they are suffering from the lack of budget, not enough budget. So they gave it or they gave some, some kind of the project to each uh, advanced statement registering agencies to do that kind of the campaign. So they are doing some social media, some posting, uh, like that I made this statement, or uh, they are supporting the lecture instructors having some, providing some lectures about life, end of life care decisions at the some educational centers uh, in the community. But those education, especially the education or campaigns toward the general population is very volunteer based, not the common or the some statement state uh, wide approach is provided still very lacking but among the people uh, general population it is very popular and something as like a japanese end note is translated in korea so we are selling it as uh, bookstores and it's a very interesting issue that we are uh, very becoming very similar society with each other Thank you, and uh, uh, it was uh, noted by uh, 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 one of our uh, one of our participants that uh, in in the United States there are, uh, well, last time I checked there were sixteen uh, states uh, that had some kind of uh, law uh, regarding end of life care, um, and uh, Hawaii, for example, was one of the first uh, states to uh, to have that. Um, the, a follow-up question, just very briefly, from Professor Lee, um, had to do with whether there's any requirement for long-term care facilities and nursing homes um, to uh, or to to make sure that their their residents have an opportunity to uh, to address uh, advanced directives. Uh, of life sustaining treatment, or whether that's just sort of uh, something that sometimes happens, sometimes not. Professor Lee? Sorry, I, oh, oh. I, uh, sorry, I, I missed you. Oh, oh. There was some breaking. So, so it, yes, in, in uh, nursing homes or long term care facilities, uh, is there uh, any process or requirement? Mm -hmm for them to uh, have their residents to uh, fill out advanced directives, that kind of thing, for life-sustaining treatment? As I mentioned, there are very strict requirements to provide end-of-life care discussion with the resident. So practically, 
uh, I remember one or two facilities could provide this kind of discussion with the resident. So they solved this issue in this way. When the patient is transferred to, from the acute care hospital to the, this long-term care facility, then the long-term care facilities asks the patient or the family members uh, prepare the advanced statement. So it, it is solved in practical way, not by the, some systematic approach. Thank, yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, so Professor uh, Kamide, um, another big, another big question, I'm afraid. Um, so, and this is something that is occurring in, in many countries, uh, but especially in Japan, uh, where the rapid uh, aging in population is resulting in, uh, especially with lower birth, with very low birth rates uh, in uh, workforce shortages, not enough workers. And uh, is there any um, plan or strategy for uh, having more workers, either by uh, immigration or uh, with foreign workers or by engaging the older adults more in the workforce uh, or uh, mostly technology, uh, automation? I don't know, but uh, uh, it's something that is a challenge. Uh, so yes, any yes. thoughts? Yes. So. Uh, what you said, so all of uh, things uh, we are trying, <laughs> and Japanese government trying, so uh, to uh, increase uh, birth weight, so government uh, pays uh, the money for uh, many children <laughs> or th their parents. So, uh, and also their uh, medical fees are free, uh, like uh, very uh, a, a good service for uh, the children. But uh, mm, still, bus weight is not increasing, little bit uh, decreasing. So, and uh, also uh, that the immigrants from uh, foreign countries, so now Japan is permitted uh, the immigrants uh, from foreign countries and the uh, uh, Japanese government uh, helps uh, to, uh, to uh, have education for the uh, Japanese uh, job for foreign uh, young uh, people. So, uh, especially for, for uh, Asian uh, countries, uh, Vietnam and Indonesia, some China. So they're coming to uh, get uh, uh, the, the techniques or, you know, the, the, they're working in the Japan, in our area. So Jap uh, the, the many uh, foreign nurses are coming to Japan. They are, uh, working in a hospital. But uh, still there is a run gauge problem or you know, support system is not, uh, uh, not perfectly uh, established. So still we have uh, many, many problems uh, for uh, the many immigrants. The COVID-19 is uh, the big issue for for the immigrants and uh, it's, it's uh, I, 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 I wish uh, this uh, virus problem uh, should be uh, resolved uh, soon. So, uh, and I mentioned the technologies, the robot and, uh, you know, is maybe, you know, uh, we work for, uh, the uh, shrinking uh, working working age uh, people, but uh, still uh, not not work well <laughs> robot systems. So in in Japan, is that the, everything is now struggling <laughs> to get uh, good success. But uh, we have to uh, trying. <laughs> We have to try and challenge. 
And also end of life care issue is now getting more important in Japan. I think uh, healthy aging and good days uh, should be set in life course for every people. So, you know, the people is living uh, in the good life, but the, the last time, so sometimes uh, they don't uh, satisfy their own death. <laughs> so uh, we need uh, to uh, establish uh, the good uh, manner for the good death. Uh, now we are trying to uh, make, uh, uh, doing research for the, the good death and the right care studies. So uh, I'm very impressed uh, for the Professor Rees uh, today's uh, presentation. And uh, last week, so, you know, advanced care planning uh, lectures, uh, three, uh, from three uh, Taiwanese uh, 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 scientists. So that was uh, being very impressed. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. So uh, it is uh, just about uh, time for us to, to finish. Uh, Colin Hayashida uh, uh, reminds us that um, what has been called the uh, compression of morbidity, the idea that uh, we should have, uh, if possible, the best possible health and well-being, not just physical health, but psychological, social, emotional well-being, um, as long as possible in our lives uh, to uh, uh, live long and die short, uh, as it were, um, uh, and I know both in Japan and Korea, there are efforts to, to promote that idea. And I think that is something that all societies and in a way all of us as individuals aspire to. Uh, I hope that uh, in its own little way, um, this uh, webinar series uh, contributes to that, contributes to our knowledge and understanding of healthy aging, healthy longevity, um, and even to the point uh, of uh, near the end of our of our lives. So I, I want to thank very much our presenters, um, Dean Miyoshi, who provides such a, a warm introduction, uh, and then uh, Professor Kamide, uh, Professor Kabayama, and Professor Lee. Thank you very, very much. I wish we could all uh, applaud you, uh, uh, but uh, you'll, I will have to do it uh, this way. Uh, and then just a um, heads up that uh, next week, at the same time, next, uh, next Wednesday uh, in, uh, here in uh, the United States and uh, uh, Thursday morning uh, in uh, East Asia, uh, we will be focusing on uh, China and Mongolia. And uh, as you uh, see from the, uh, from the slide, uh, we'll have again uh, three uh, distinguished presenters uh, talking about perspectives in China and in Mongolia. Uh, again, addressing these issues of aging and health and some of the implications um, for, a, uh, for a society. So thank you all very much. Thank you for participating. Thank you again to uh, Winston Tseng uh, and to our sponsors for uh, making this possible. We hope to see you again next week at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Sherlock, for the sharing today's webinar. You're very welcome. Uh, it's good to see everybody. Hope to see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.